Hello, Trail Seeker, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. We have an amazing interview today. Uh, just strap in that seatbelt and get ready to have your world totally rocked by today's guest. Eric Thornton is a fantastic healer in the spiritual realm and also emotional, mental, and energetic. Uh, he brings some amazing value to today's interview. Uh, there, there's times when, as I was editing this show, I had to pause and write down so many things he said. They were quotes that have left me thinking and uh, seeing my world in a different way, and I know it'll help you to gain perspective. His specialty is helping healers to heal. So I know a lot of listeners that listen to this show uh, are healers themselves, whether you work in the space already, or whether you just know that you love helping people and you're looking to heal yourself and also help those you love. I think you'll really enjoy today's interview, and it's definitely an interesting one. Another thing I know you will enjoy is something that my friend George Shepard is putting on this week. He has a wonderful webinar, a free educational webinar on these 10 specific essential oils that you need to have in your medicine cabinet. They're highly effective at uh, helping the body to heal from certain conditions, some really common conditions. So his thing is that you jump into his webinar and he spends, uh, about, I think it's about 30 minutes teaching you about 10 essential oils that everyone should have in their life to maintain health and also to address the most common concerns that come up, the most common symptoms that people go through, whether it's skin issues, digestion, sleep, anxiety, stress, headaches, or pain. Uh, the list goes on and on. So he covers so many topics. I'd love for you to join his webinar. It's coming up this Thursday. There's two time slots. And uh, if you can't make it to the Thursday, still sign up because I believe there's also a replay that comes later after Sunday. So sign up for it. It's learntruehealth.com slash 10. That's learntruehealth.com slash 10, either spelt out or the number. And if you go there, you're going to be able to access his wonderful free educational webinar on essential oils. Uh, he's just as passionate about essential oils as I am. And I know he actually has a few more webinars uh, that teach different topics that he's going to give us in the future. Uh, one that I'm really excited about is he has one on using essential oils while you're doing your emotional healing work to really help the body to move through, help the, the mind and the heart to heal and move through emotional trauma and emotional work as you're as you're addressing it. So that's a more advanced webinar he's going to put on later. This is his foundational webinar, but at the end of it you will know exactly which 10 essential oils should be in your medicine cabinet to help yourself and help your family. You may even have some of them in your home already and he will give you new ways and new ideas for using them and when and why to use them. So it's a fantastic webinar. I'm very excited that he could bring this to us. He, just like me, is as passionate about holistic health and uh, education and helping people. So it's exciting that he's giving us, uh, the Learn True Health listeners, this webinar. So go to learntruehealth.com slash 10. That's learntruehealth.com slash 10. Sign up now. I'll see you in the webinar on Thursday. It'll be a lot of fun. And enjoy today's interview. Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 327. Well, I am really excited for today's guest. Eric Thornton is an amazing healer. He's a healer who helps healers heal. <laughs> Say that three times fast. I was told that we had to have him on the show. Absolutely amazing man. And I am just in love with the work that he does. He's a spiritual healer, a medium, an animal communicator, a medical intuitive, and he's an expert in eternal psychology. Uh, he's written a beautiful book, and we'll definitely talk about that later. But he has a natural and innate born gift for the, the spiritual world. And uh, I just love, Eric, the stories that you've shared with me so far. Um, I can really relate to what you've gone through. And I know a lot of healers uh, who listen, because we have a lot of healers that listen, 
whether they're actively working in the field or whether they just feel the calling and they've always been um, very sensitive or intuitive towards people's feelings and, and sickness and emotions. Y you have this gift and you've honed it in and you help so many people to figure out what they need to do mentally, emotionally, spiritually, energetically, and physically to heal their bodies. And I love that you connect with the spiritual realm as well to support people in their health. Most of the time on the show, we interview naturopaths, chiropractors, acupuncturists, medical doctors, and I want to explore every possible realm when it comes to holistic health. I want to make sure that no stone is left unturned, that the listener has the full spectrum when it comes to health. And health needs to include energetic health, spiritual health, physical, mental, and emotional. So we need to address all of the aspects of our being and our psyche to make sure that we are coming into balance and doing everything we can to be as healthy as possible and then help others do the same. And I love that that is your mission in life. So welcome to the show, Eric. Well, thank you, Ashley. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. We've had a wonderful conversation before we hit record. And uh, I was like, wait, wait, stop. I got to record this. This is so good. <laughs> So I would love for you to start by sharing your story because you have a wonderful story that I really relate to. And so does my husband. We both were reading your bio and and we just knew that other listeners would resonate with what you went through growing up. And also it helps us to understand your gifts, your natural gifts to help in helping people. Right. I was born with what people tell me the gifts are on and the... Um, so people refer to me as a master. Now it's not a master as in taking a course and getting a certificate. It's a master as an in innate ability. And the um, um, and I was born that way. I have no idea how to look at the world differently than I do. And they, um, um, well, I take that back. They did shut me off for a few days so I could experience it. And I felt completely blind. Mm. and alone because I was no longer connected to the rest of the universe. And I was literally after the fourth day, I was in tears and they, uh, and they connected me back up and it was like, thank you. This was like, I lost my part of my family. So I get to, I was born with this ability to see, hear, experience, communicate with beings that are beyond this, what we call our, our well, our human sight. And they, we all see, um, other beings out of the corners of our eyes. We see a flash and we turn and look, there's nothing there. And they, um, um, I get to pull it right in front of me and talk to a person's angels and guides and other beings in the universe, um, right? Like I'm talking to an individual. And they, um, um, and they're, if they're working for, for our benefit, for our, I call it benevolent uh, versus non benevolent. And if they're working towards our benefit, they work within our our pathway, our walkway, whatever you want to call it, our karmic learning cycle, whatever it is, whatever words the person wants to use. But the, um, um, when I was young, I was just, you know born with this going, and I'm sitting here, talk, see these beings, they're telling me about people's lives, they're telling me something's wrong with them, they've, they've got a stomach ache, they've got a, a cancer, they've got um, you know whatever is going on, arthritis, Someone died in their family. They got emotional problems. I, I, I'm this little kid. I'm, I'm two years old. I'm experiencing this. I learned at a very young age to, when I talked about these things, I learned to shut my mouth and they, uh, because people didn't want to hear it. You know, I'm this four-year-old telling someone, well, you know, you're, you're sick. You know, mom, you're sick. You need to lie down. And she wasn't. And then she'd get sick. Or, you know, I could tell she was getting a migraine or something like that. Or something's wrong with a neighbor kid or that type of a thing. And when my, uh, you know, I, when I would see a problem, physical problem, whether it was whether it was medical or whether it was something going wrong with a house. I mean, I got inf I get information on virtually anything I put my concentration to. And I, I know it sounds a little grandiose, but it's just the way it is. So it's like my uh, um, 
when I was 12, I remodeled my mom's kitchen. I know what I was doing, but I had instructors, so to speak. And my, we went to the old pay and pack. And my mom goes, get him what he wants. Because I was told, you need this, 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 and this. So I used it. And I, I was in construction for 20 years, putting myself through college, part, you know, not all the way through, but through some of college. And then in a business, in construction, and I used it in my work. Um, um, because I would just get in the information that's in front of me, you know, about what was in front of me. And people sometimes call me a walking encyclopedia because <laughs> ask me a question. I just look at my guides. I go, huh, what's the answer? And they give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and I just kind of go, well, this is what I'm told. <laughs> and it's like, right. And uh, so I used to, I, I worked for a microfilm company for a couple of years. And uh, I would fix their cameras because I just knew how to do it. I'd take the circuit boards out and put new pieces in them. And it worked. So I, it's not only medical intuitive, it's intuitive about all kinds of things. And when you're a little kid, you're considered a little smart mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned to keep my mouth shut. But, you know, my brothers would get, as we talked about earlier, they, they'd get the flu. They'd go to school. They were school before me. And they'd come home with it. Or one of them would come home with it, the first one. And I would feel his flu. And he would get better. And then the next one would get it. And then I'd feel this flu. And they'd get better. And then I'd actually get the flu. So I'd have it three times or more, depending on who got it in the house. And they just thought I was sickly. Mm. <laughs> and I wasn't. I was healing their flu. And the um, um, and that worked that way with anybody I was around. If they had a broken arm, I'd feel it. Their arm would be healed and in a day or two. And then it would, you know, and I'd feel the pain. And it was kind of miserable. I didn't know what was going on. So... So anyway, needless to say, I learned to keep my mouth shut. I learned to just say what was necessary about whatever I was experiencing. Other than that, I didn't do it, and I didn't put it there. And so I would, and I, we, I mentioned this earlier too, As in one of the experiences I would have is we were raised Catholic, and so we'd go to church on Sundays, and and uh, if anybody in church would get was, was ill, I and I knew it, I'd get the stigmata marks and I'm like, oh. and then they would sometimes talk about the stigmata marks, the marks of Christ and about only, only special people got that and this and that and the other. And I'm like going, no, 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 I'm just, you know, no, this can't be. And I just denied it. Well, what I learned is when energy is being, you're being used as a conductor of healing energy, when you resist it. So I, you know, someone in church was sick. I didn't want to grab onto them. There, I'm this little kid. <laughs> and so I'd hold the energy back. And that's it's kind of like um, electric burner on a stove. It's resistance that causes the heat. Well, I'd resist the healing energy, and it would cause heat in the palm of the hands and the grounding in the bottoms of your feet. And then because you're resisting, your pancreas drains all your, your, your blood sugar and whatever, puts out all insulin and whatever, and you get this pain in your side in the migratory space position of the pancreas so and I'd, I'd get this i'd go to church and i'd get this and then they'd like you say they'd say you were special if you got that and i denied that of course so i didn't like going to church very well either because it kind of made me sick <laughs> so so anyway i would um i just keep it to myself i'd keep my hands covered i'd keep my feet covered and i'd get these dark red marks till they turn brown and i just kept my hands to myself didn't share it with anybody because um, in the family I grew up in, I'd be made fun of or, or called paranoid or because I'd feel everyone's sickness. So they'd think I know I was sick all the time. And uh, um, so I just uh, grew up with these things. And when I was 10, um, we, in the book, um, I, I mentioned a person named Ryan. Well, he was a he was actually a, a brother. I, you have to change the names. You have to do everything when you're right. Anyway, my brother had terminal cancer when he was 12. I was 10. And, um, uh, uh, you know, it was, he had two biopsies. And they said, well, he's not going to make it. And the, he was, but they were going to give him surgery and just to buy him some time. So the day before surgery, 
uh, a friend of my mom's, or her name is, was, she's passed now, Sister Denise, and um, she knew I was a healer. I didn't, but she did. She knew my mother, she met my mother when my mother was in eighth grade. She was her eighth grade, one of her eighth grade teachers. And so she knew me from birth. And she apparently knew I was special somehow. So the day before the surgery, my mother called up Sister Denise for prayer healing. She had a ministry of prayer healing. And so Sister Denise set me up, and I didn't realize it, and I didn't realize anything really happened at that point. But she said, Eric, I want you to put your hand on your brother. And I want the other to join hands and pray. And, uh, okay, I'm 10 years old. What do I know? And so she's on the, on the end of the phone. She started praying her petition. It's called the gift of healing through petition. And the, um, um, she started praying, and all of a sudden this beautiful energy came through. It was amazing. I remember the feeling today. It was so unique to me at 10 years old. And it was warm, it was inviting, it was embracing, it was just, it was like all the colors of the rainbow all in one. It was amazing. And I looked at people and thought, well, everyone was feeling this, right? What do I know? So she prayed for a few minutes, whatever, it ended. He went in for surgery the next day, the cancer was completely gone. Oh my gosh. And they, um, and we were thinking, oh, miracle, you know? Wow, great, amazing. The doctors call it spontaneous healing. And I'm sitting here going, well, it's wonderful. We never talked about it again. Really? That was it. And it was, we were kind of a closed family because of trauma and stuff in our lives. Mm. And the, um, um, it wasn't until 20 some years later where I started doing this. It was 30 years later, I guess, started doing this. And the um, full time that we actually talked about it, we talked about it with my mom. And she goes, yeah, I recall doing that. And I remember, you know, obviously your brother's still alive. And the, um, I said, do you feel anything? He said, no, I didn't. I go, huh, interesting. And the, um, um, and just left it at that. And the, uh, But I now know I let the healing, I, I was used for that. I let the healing go through. And he got that result. Uh, you know, it's not my doing. I just am, I'm just the, the radio tower, if you will. <laughs> and the um and he's alive and well today. So um so anyway, experiences like that growing up. And people have always felt odd around me as far as routine. You know, people will they'll, they'll feel special things and um and it's it's been a an ongoing thing throughout my life. And again, I say I don't know any different. I just look at the world when I meet someone. I can turn it off, so to speak, now, kind of push it into the background mm. because I don't need to know everything about anybody. Right. <laughs> you know, if I did, there's 7 billion people's information coming into my head. <laughs> and it's like, no, I don't want that. And it's overwhelming and it will kill mm -hmm. when it's at this level. So Sister Denise went on years later. Um, she's the one who really got me to do this full time. And the, um, I had a client who was dying from cancer and uh, in my construction business. And he happened to be a psych, uh, psychiatrist. And, the, um, and he was, I was rebuilding one of his homes. And, um, and I was really frustrated because he, would, he had cancer. And I'd finished rebuilding one of his homes and hadn't talked to him for a couple of months. And his wife called me up. And she goes, Eric, I, do you know a healer? And I go, no, why? He goes, well, David's sick, and he's in the hospital to die. And I go, oh. I said, I'm so sorry. She goes, well, do you know a healer? And I go, well, no, I don't. She goes, Eric, do you know a healer? And I go, no, I don't. Because goes, Eric, come on, do you know a healer? <laughs> she knew something. And I go, no, but I know somebody who works with a healer who has a gift. She goes, fine. So I call up Sister Denise, and she goes, well, the partner I was working with, she worked with a part healer in California, a person like myself. She goes, she just passed. She was 98. She goes, Eric, but you're a healer. So she called me on it. And I go, no, I'm not. And she goes, yes, you are a healer. Remember your brother and all those instances growing up? And I go, 
yes, but I'm a contractor. She goes, no, you're a healer. And she goes, what are you calling it about? And I said this, told her the story with, with this guy. And he was at Northwest Hospital. He goes, well, let's go there tomorrow. And I goes, no. <laughs> and she goes, I'm going to call the nun card on you. <laughs> I, go, I go, no, not that. <laughs> she goes, yes. I'll pick you up at nine o'clock <laughs> and I'm going, Oh, so, so I'm going, you know, who am I to call on God, so to speak, to heal somebody. Right. And she's like, she's like, Eric, just do what I tell you to do when you're there. I'm like, fine. So he called up his wife and we, the three of us went in and, um, to the hospital and he's lying there. And, uh, Sister Denise goes, she goes, um, Eric, just put your hands over the top of them and let them move where they're going to move. And I go, really? <laughs> she goes, yes, just they're going to move. Just let them do it. And I go, okay. She goes, it'll happen as soon as I start praying. And so she goes over to the edge and she starts praying and my hands go, bam, right to where all his cancer was. And I had no idea what kind of cancer he had or where it was. And I felt this huge energy come over me. And this took an hour, and I was lying there in puddles under each of my armpits on the floor, literally just sweating. And she comes. I finally go, look, I gotta get away from this. I can't do this anymore. And I said, I said, put a chair behind me. I gotta throw myself away from this energy. Literally, I couldn't let go. And he put a chair behind me, and I literally threw myself into the chair. And sister asked the guy how how he was doing. He goes. Now, remember, this is a psychiatrist. <laughs> he, goes, <laughs> he goes, so how are you doing? He goes, well, I feel terrific. But he goes, Eric looks like shit. <laughs> <laughs> I go, yeah, <laughs> I feel horrible. And she goes, come on, come on, we got to play at the parking lot. We got to pay the energy release. We got to do this, that, and the other, and da, da, da. And I'm like, going, okay, because I'm kind of stunned at this point. And his wife's like going, She's like going, wow, what's going on? Da, 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 da. So we, she scurries us all out to the parking lot. We get next to the cars, and she prays this, energy, this prayer of release. And the three of us were picked flat to the ground, per, uh, per, uh, parallel to it, and thrown on the ground. And we physically got hurt. Sister broke her arm. Glasses broke. I got, we all got scuffed up. And we're all like going, huh? Literally picked up, parallel to the ground, and thrown on it. Why? Well, I was sitting here going, that's what I said. I said, what is going on? Well, he had a demon that was making him sick, and you took that demon on. And I'm going, okay, demons, what's all this stuff? What that, blah, 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 those are words. What does that mean? You know, I was raised Catholic. I know what it means there, but this was something physical that happened to us. And then he got, he was ill because of it. Mm -hmm. Well, we brought, brought, we were at the hospital. We brought her to the hospital. We got you know, got her arm fixed, uh, set, reset, da, 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 went home. My son got instant pneumonia. He was three, um, three or four, and then he's 25 now. And they, um, and he's, you know, I call sister Denise up. She goes, well, probably the demon got into him. So we prayed, we moved it, felt this energy move again. I brought him to the hospital. They said he had double pneumonia. They gave him some big shots in his butt. And the next day, he was better. 100% better. Wow. He was back to himself. Six weeks later, I'm working for another psychiatrist, a uh, friend of this guy. The guy calls up, or comes up to me, and he goes, so you know Dave's better. He's in full remission. And I go, I looked at him. He's a psychiatrist. I looked at him. I go, good. And I turned around and walked away. <laughs> so I was like, okay, so what do I do with this? And why is he telling? Why isn't he? Why is he telling me this? But he's using a few words, and it's kind of like whoa. And the um, so I started thinking, you know, okay, there's something to this, but you can't get sick whenever you work on somebody. Yeah. So he started doing research and looking back at my life as a child in this research, and there's no books written about people like me. Mm. There's nothing out there, and it's. I was told, Sister Denise explained it to me. She goes, Eric, you are, you have the gifts, plural, of healing. 
not the gift of miracles, but the gifts of healing, which is 1 Corinthians 12. And I'm not of any particular faith, so don't, I'm using some words here. But it talks about it's plural in most versions. And then she explained there's the gift of faith, not in a church, but in what you're experiencing. Gift of command, which means a person's angels and guides and other beings will show up when you start doing work. Gift of second sight, second knowledge, and hearing, so that you can have discussions with them about the person's pathway and how they're going. Thus, that was the beginning of what we were given the word eternal psychology. We were given these word because we are souls having a human experience. I mean, it's a classic line, but it's like, that's the truth. We're souls. We have a body very temporarily at this moment. We have many lives with many bodies, but right now we're in this body and it's dominant. But we're having a soul experience. The soul, if people think about it for a minute, a soul can't taste chocolate. You know, a soul can't be male or female. That, that's an animal. That's a genital thing. And, the, um, and it's like the soul sits here and it's, it's learning. It's growing. It's experiencing, if you want to use, you know, uh, old age terms, it's experiencing. It's a part of God experiencing itself experiencing mm -hmm. evolution experiencing growth experiencing all these other beings and i've learned that's what we are but we identify with the body and when we identify with the body we get things like allopathic medicine <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know it's cause and effect da, da, da. you know you get the scientific rigidity Where's the pill? Where's the pill for that symptom? Exactly. <laughs> and that, it just doesn't work fully. You know, I tell people, Western medicine, allopathic medicine is great at the mechanics. You know, that's all we got. You got a broken arm, they set it. You got something wrong with your heart, they try to fix it. But they're not good at the, at the difficult things, the things that get us ill. And the um, or pr pr create a platform for illness, and that's what I've learned since childhood. Watching people, watching their sicknesses as a kid, that innocent point of view, and I've kept that innocent point of view very on purpose. I've read very few books, talked to very few people about this, so that I am forced to listen to the guides and angels and other beings about what is going on with the individual. And, why they have the illness, like this guy in the hospital. He took on a non-benevolent energy. Mm -hmm. And the uh, people call them demons, they call them this, that, and the other. Whatever drama you want to put with it, it's great. But it was trying to control him. And it was. And it was making him ill. It was controlling him through illness. And you get rid of that, suddenly the body can fix itself. Mm -hmm. It's like an energetic parasite. Correct. Right. Because we can believe in parasites because we've seen them or, you know, we can look up in textbooks and see them. Right. And and I always tell my listeners, I'm like the most open minded skeptic. Uh -huh. I've so had, am I. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had these I've had an experience in the past with what you could can call, you know, some people might call a demon or or a negative entity or energy or whatever, whatever it is. It's it's like doesn't have form and it no, does not does want happen. good for you. It does not want good for you and it doesn't have form. And so we, we've experienced, I mean, people have, you, everyone's experienced that you walk into an, an, someplace, maybe a house or a building or a restaurant or a bar or whatever, you walk somewhere or a dark alleyway, but you walk somewhere and you get like the, I really should not be here feeling. And there's no logical reason why, but like just the creepy, like it's not, you know, so we've all experienced, right. you know, something unseen and we're and our gut is saying you got to get out of here and so we've experienced a negative energy or negative you know we can't quite put our finger on it so everyone's experienced that yeah or that could be your angel going mm. uh dude get out of here <laughs> right so it doesn't have to be a negative form warning you that way but w whatever it is everyone has, yes. ha has experienced something Correct. that they can't quite explain they can't put their finger on it there's no physical there's no physicality to it and yet there was 
a sensation like that's the sixth sense saying something right and yes. so whether whether it was a you know because some people may not believe in angels so but but we can right. all agree that we could probably look back in our life and go oh yeah that one time i really felt uh -huh. like something was off and then and then i uh, maybe even listened to that feeling of something uh -huh. being off and then avoided something bad mm -hmm. you know so it's like we can all agree that there are times in our life where we've had a sensation that is not physical and yet it's been on the level of intuition or right. gut feeling. Well, it's when one of the credentials you didn't quite mention in the beginning was I'm an exorcist. Well, an exorcist removes energy, right? It can be different. It can be, it can have a life of its own or it can be dependent on another being's life. Mm. And the, um, um, and it's like, it can be people think of exorcists and think of the dramas on TV or in the movie theater. Well, it can be dramatic. There's no question about that. But most of us, the stuff we carry around with it isn't dramatic. And the um, so and the, what I've learned over the years about different types of energies um, er, with different types of beings is we label them <laughs> and the labeling actually makes it difficult, makes it more difficult to uh, come to neutral in your energetic field where, you, where there's nothing else in it except your own energy. And, the, uh, and then there's, and I've learned over the years, the different types of energy. And do I know it all? No. Do I will ever claim to know it all? No. But I've, I'm constantly learning new types of energy and new and the types of energy meaning things like thought forms. Thought forms can appear, and people can see them as a being. Or, um, and the more intense of someone thinks of something, the thicker that energy gets. So that there, there's cultural thought forms, and they're massive cult thought forms that literally control behaviors of people that contribute or that are part of that culture. Mm. And it tells you when you are within the culture and when you are leaving that culture. In your own thoughts so what is it to be jewish to be black to be white to be catholic to be buddhist to these are all thought forms that millions and millions of people and billions of people over the years have contributed to and it creates these massive thoughts of behavior including things like sickness like you know the american cancer society there's a huge thought form with that. You know, I've got cancer. Oh my gosh. Well, that's thought form. Mm. You know, cancer, people have cancer all the time. And the, uh, but once you've been diagnosed, it's like you just go down this squirrely little trail into this drama and it actually promotes the sickness. Where if you cannot identify with an illness you have, it's most likely going to go away because you're not connecting to the thought form. So that's one of the things we do with people that have cancer is we disconnect them from those thought forms and we teach them the positivity and what they're learning, what they're growing from this and da da da. da. And that at that point we can generally move the cancer. If the, you know if that's in fact in their pathway and they uh, it'll disappear very quickly or disappear with the medicine or whatever it is. A guide will tell me how it works for an individual. And they um um so it's like, you know, I, it's, it's, I, I mentioned earlier about my uh, brother having cancer when he was 12 and I was 10 and the, uh, he didn't identify with it. He had it from medicine my mother took and when she was in, when he was in vitro and the, um, and he had terminal cancer when he was 12, he was biopsied twice. And this is where sister Denise um, came to. The re came to the rescue, sort of, so to speak, is my brother was scheduled to have uh, exploratory surgery, remove the, sur remove the cancer, and buy him some time. They figured he had six months to live. And the day before he was going for that surgery, she, my mother connected with her. She did her gift of petition and prayer, mm -hmm. and she told me to hold on to Mike, to put my hand on him, and everyone else just hold hands. And so she started praying, on the phone in California, up here into Bothell, and the um, and she, 
I felt this huge energy go through me. Enormous. It was, it was amazing. It was like, um, I, I use the word like rainbow of, of color and beauty and feeling. And it was, I was like, wow, this is really cool. I was 10. Right. And the next day he went in for the surgery and it was, his cancer was completely gone. And the doctors go, well, spontaneous healing. And the, uh, which it was obviously. And, uh, and we just all thought miracle sister Denise, da, 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 da. and sister Denise is the one who, you know, I told you about David here and the, um, and brought me full circle from that to doing this full time. And the, um, um, so, so anyway, through the years I've learned and I've learned what questions to ask and wait for questions. I see a person's angels and guides, whether we believe them or not, or whether we use different words for them or not, as if I was talking to the individual. And they tell me about what is going on. If a person has anxiety, what's it from? It's not, not the symptom, not what's causing the anxiety at the moment, but where does it come from? Why is, do they have an overload of anxiety where another person doesn't have an overload? So like I had this lady, lovely lady come in and she, anxiety, I'd known her for years, terrible anxiety, and nothing really happened with it. And then one day, um, they were working on it. And they showed me her grandfather when he was really young. And they showed him working in coal. And I'm like going, so did your grandfather work in coal? And he goes, yeah, I said, I'm seeing a, some sort of a, industrial plant or something that looks like it's kind of in the in the southeast or kind of central in the area there maybe north carolina somewhere in there and she goes well my grandfather used to shovel coal into the power plant of nashville and i'm going you're kidding she goes no it was before he was married he was young it was just a quick summertime job or wintertime job and the um i go well you know what comes with coal is mercury and she goes, really? And I go, yeah. And I go, so he got mercury poisoning before he was married or had children. And then all his children, your father, have anxiety. It was caused by the mercury changing his genetics. Yeah. And she loved her grandfather. So she'd been in many natural paths and they couldn't get the mercury levels to go down in her. It could, wouldn't happen, but mercury equaled love because it was her grandfather. So if her body got rid of the mercury, get rid of his love. So we were able to separate it. Then her body went, the mercury levels dropped, and then her anxiety dropped to normal levels. So it's we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. The energetics of everything we do affect us. Everything. So I'm I'm sitting here when when I was, you know, it's, I, I had this uh, psychologist bring me a pendant one day, and the, she goes, "Can you read this?" And I said, "Sure." So she put it in my hand, and I'm going, "Whoa!" I go, "Where'd you get this?" She said, "Why?" And I go, "Where did you get this?" And she goes, "But why?" I go, because this has been involved in a jewelry heist. And she looked at me, and she goes, well, I was testing you. I go, what do you mean? She goes, well, my sister's a jewelry wholesaler, and she buys from the police department. And that was a recovery from a jewelry heist. <laughs> wow. And I go, I go, really? <laughs> and she goes, yeah. And I go, well, it's got this energy with it. It was a new object when it was heisted. And the um um so that guy I could see all the people that you know where the diamonds came from where the silver came from where the gold came from etc. And uh, tell you if they were paid equally or fairly or wherever. And the uh, but I said it's got this negative stigma stigma with it. And the um and so we cleared that and then it felt good to, for her to wear it. But everything is in everything we do. Every intention every thought, everything. We are energetic beings. And it, and it affects our health. 
our mental health, our physical health, our spiritual health. It affects, I work with a lot of doctors and therapists of all sorts. And so you got a, a someone, a chiropractor, they'll send someone to me, they can't get in their body to settle. And we'll do a um, bunch of our work with them. And then they go back to the chiropractor and their body totally opens up. And it and their and their back gets better and their body line uh, lines up and they don't have to see the chiropractor very much. Same way with acupuncture or medical doctors or allergists, things like that. We can go in and look at and clear what's blocking us. Now, what I've learned through the years from childhood is like energy comes together. So not only the yin and the yang, the positive and negative, but also the negative and negative <laughs> and the positive and positive. The power of positive thinking is amazing. The power of negative thinking is even, unfortunately, we go to that first. Yes. <laughs> Let's so help with it's that. called survival. <laughs> right. And we hit that first and we draw that to us. And it comes from past life. It comes from this life. It comes from attitudes we get from childhood and from past life. And it's, you know, we all experience it. You know, we sit here and you have someone who's a, a negative person. Let's say they're angry. Well, angry is a tertiary emotion, so there's a lot behind it. But angry people don't hang out with people that are not angry. <laughs> That's just a common example. You know, someone who's real positive in life, they don't want to hang out with someone who's negative. Just don't work. The negative person wants to hang out with other negative people. You know, you sit here, angry people draw angry situations to them. They draw angry words. They draw angry actions. They draw angry behaviors. They also draw angry entities. And it's designed that way so that we grow. And I look at entities as something we to learn from, grow from, and then it's able to be removed out of the energy field. And if it is commanded out of someone's energy, and that's most exorcists, you're not healing anything. You're still leaving the negativity in that person, and that energy or one like it will come back and fill the space. That's why a typical exorcism is so difficult and so hard to do. Where the work we do here, we see who, what, when, where, and why, and it's time's up. What did we learn from it? How do we grow? Time's up and it's gone. It's very simple. Very little drama. They try, but it's very little drama. And that goes for anything. Everything we look at, everything is positive. And what are, what are we learning from it? If we have negative parents, negative childhood, why? What are we learning? What are we, what are we supposed to learn from that from our parents? And we turn it into a positive thing so that the person could move on and it stops stressing their body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I was young growing up, I got to watch and I got to see the psychology of what I would see energetically and then to watch it unfold physically. And I started learning about this balance between spiritual energy and physical. And I started and being able to see and start understanding what was going on and that works with animals as well animals are innocent so they generally don't have possessions but once in a while they do but it's rare but the um, um animals are just another being you know i can hear i can experience or hear a person's thoughts well i can hear that from an animal as well and so i can tell you their story i can tell you what's wrong with them to tell you how to fix whatever's going on with them, run healing energy, have them feel better. Horses, they're amazing. Dogs, cats, amazing. It's amazing. There was this horse, oh gosh, I've worked on a lot of animals, but it's, <laughs> so which story did I go to? This horse I was recently worked on, it was on Woodby Island, and it is a retired racehorse. And I walk into the barn, and I hadn't met the horse yet, and it was this big male horse. And I just felt itchy from head to toe. Just, oh my gosh, this itch. And, the, um, and it was like, 
Okay, what's going on here? So I walk into the barn. He's happened to be the only horse in the barn at the time. And I'm like going, oh my gosh. And I scratched him. He's going, oh. And I'm going, how long have you had this horse? He said, oh, for three or four years. I go, has anybody dressed as itching? He goes, well, he doesn't itch. I go, yes, he itches. He doesn't have a way of telling you. He itches from head to toe. I said, what are you feeding him? And they told me, you go, well, you're feeding him a high sugar diet. So he's got candida. And they, uh, so we switched his diet. And, um, and that, so that took a few weeks. But right then I was work, work, working with him. He was agitated all the time. He goes, yeah, he's agitated. Cause I said, it's because he itches. And, he, and so I was with him for a while and he wouldn't really let me work on it because he was so agitated from the itching. Mm. So I finally go, I go, look, is it the person, this horse's person here? And they go, no, but this lady is the one who rides her, rides him. And I go, okay, I need her in here. So she came in and he knew her then again. He needed someone to reassure him that I was okay. And the, um, so she's petting him. And so I come up to him then and address him more directly then. And he let me in. I go, okay, he's letting me in. And the horse completely relaxed. We got rid of his itch instantly. And he just looked at me and looked at her and stopped being agitated, stopped being upset in any way, shape, or form, and just took a deep breath let out a bunch of energy, his teeth came out, and he just breathed deep and let it out. And for the first time since he was in, he was five years old or four, six years old, first time in five years, he didn't itch. And the, the horse completely changed personalities. And the, um, um, still, he had bad habits because he'd been agitated for so long, and he found out he could get attention if he a bit misbehaved. <laughs> But since then, he's calmed down just over time because he's getting positive reinforcement now for not agitating. But the itching taught him to stir the pot. And this is the, you can't change behavior if you still got the agitator. And that's whether it's physical or demonic or some sort or something like that. Can't change the behavior unless you change that. So how did you, so it was the candida that was causing the itch? Yes. So how did you so we, help him heal the candida? Well, we changed, we went through his diet and we changed the diet and then we gave him, um, I listened to the guides. They said, okay, mix a gallon of water and put this and this in it. And they, um, um, and then spray that on him and it, to help kill the candida from the outside and then change the diet, kill it from the inside. And it was, it, never came back so it's gone and the um they sprayed it on him for about i told him to spray it on him for six weeks and the um um just to be sure it's gone and then um and change the diet because it takes a while to change the diet on a horse and the um um and the horse is fine That's so so, cool. so i get it i get advice on what to do it's like with humans i get advice on what to do for their food and it's not all the same you know, I eat one way, other people get to eat another way. And it's and it's for their particular body, I get the information on what they need for their body. And we want the blood work. I, I like science to prove everything we do, if it's possible. And they, uh, we get the blood work and see the blood work improve by changing diet specific to that person. And the, um, no one diet fits all. And the... Um, um, same thing with animals. I get the information on what they need to eat. And the, uh, a lot of animals, uh, uh, animals are fed too many goodies and they get fat. And like us, <laughs> and the, uh, except they get diseases really fast from being overweight. And the, um, so we look at the animal and go, well, okay, so how do we make it so this animal can lose weight so the diseases can go away? And, um, you know, like you said, your cat's 20 pounds. <laughs> well, okay. You know, a big cat should be 15 to 18 pounds. <laughs> yeah, he's got some weight to lose. We're, we're working yeah. on it. I know. Right. I, yeah. And you and I are going to work on it. This will be fun. Yeah. <laughs> this will be fun. <laughs> it is. It's, it's, it is interesting to see the animals change. And you don't want them hungry. So how do you, you know, how do you change that so they're not hungry? And they still can lose weight. So, so anyway, it's, you know... We run into behaviors, for example, you know, 
I had this, uh, it was an, another horror story. I had this animal I went to see and uh, for 4-H, it was four horses lined up. And the, uh, so I get to the first horse and I'm going, oh my gosh, this cow, this horse has had five stillborns. And I was just like, it was so sad. And the horse was sad. I go, is this horse depressed? She goes, yeah, she just won't walk. She won't do anything. She just won't sit in your stall. And I go, well, who's this person, this horse's person? And the young lady stood up and I go, well, come here. I go, I want you to imagine that you had five stillborns. You know, she was 14, so she's never been pregnant. Well, uh, that I knew of at the time, <laughs> anyway. And I want you to imagine that. And I want you to go in the stall with this horse and curry her, give her some plums, her favorite thing's plums. She looked at him and she goes, yeah, it is. <laughs> and I go, and she likes the food in her manger. You know, that's the feeding trough, but she doesn't like it out of your hand. She likes it in the manger. She goes, yeah. And I go, just sit with her, give her some nice food, and be with her moment of pain. She's had five stillborns, and she wants to have a baby. <laughs> and so she did that, and she called me the next day, and the horse was happy. And she went on to have many live colts. This was 10 years ago. She's had three that I know of. And, they, um, um, and they've been great. And it just took the human, that human, to, you know, they were sad that the horse had five stillborns, but they didn't relate to the horse. <laughs> they, yeah, sometimes it's it, we treat animals like they're objects. Yeah. And they have emotions, too. They have complex oh. emotions like we do. Oh, they do, and they're smart. Yeah, they are. They just, they have, considering they have no language <laughs> to speak of, so to speak, they have, I mean, they have communications, but they do it mostly tele telepathically and with little nudges and sounds, but they don't have an explicit language and they have to figure us out. And we're all ADD. <laughs> Our <laughs> brains are all over the place. And they're like going, dude, slow down. You know? <laughs> and the, uh, and that's one of the ways we teach people to communicate is you slow your brain down mm. and you, um, you, Slow it down and you get one image at a time. You know, I had a my and my sister in law had a blind horse and I could ride the horse because and I'm not a horse rider, but I could ride her horse because I just showed her where she was going and she'd step over logs and do all kinds of things because I'd show her them as we were riding. And the um um and it was she loved it. When you say show her, you mean in your mind's eye? In in my mind's eye. And the um um and she could we could take, we could go for rides and she was fine. And the um, um and I'm no horseman. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a. I, I don't ride horses, <laughs> but that horse, I just did it to. I did it basically to show her how to do that. And the um, um, so all animals are that way, and we like to respect them. And then you get much farther if you respect who they are. You know, their souls have enough experience too, having a physical experience too, and they're amazing. And the um, um. So with, with humans, we get things like, um, um, like poisoning from past life or from family genetics. We get um, past life coming forward. I know it's a controversial subject with a lot of religions, but it doesn't negate religions as far as their premise. It only, it's like, you know, in, in Christianity, Jesus never talked about past life one way or another. And it was a common thing until um, 1400s. And it doesn't negate Christianity. It only negates the control that humans have put together in their thought processes about the afterlife. And the, um, um, so if you can control the afterlife, you can control people in the current life well especially so, if they think they're going to have a eternity of damnation so they better you know straighten up and listen be to good. the government <laughs> yeah, better be really good <laughs> whatever that means and the um but the fact is we all have lots of well not everybody has lots of but we have past life and we grow from it we learn from it we bring that into this life in the form of um of things that we're good at and things that we have fears of from birth. 
we bring those things forward. Most of past life is wonderful. It gives us all of our innate abilities, like maybe your ability to interview people, um, your ability to be a mom or a dad or a, or a, someone with lots of compassion, a, t a natural born teacher, a natural born, born musician. Most of us, most of it is positive. People have really good lives, generally speaking. But you look at human history through books and people write about the negativity. Yeah, we all have negative stuff happen. And we're here to learn from it. If it hasn't, if we haven't finished the learning, we will have that occur again or similar to it in another life so that we can finish the learning for the soul. So let's say you die, a person dies in a past life while they're um, being traumatized. Well, there was no working out the problem. There was no recovery. There was no psychological benefit if you died from a trauma. Well, in the next life, you might have fear of that whatever the trauma might be. And it might be because you died in it, it might be an unreasonable fear or something happening. So I use this example for this. It's a, I had this little boy that was brought to me. He was 18 months old. And he, his mom's chief complaint was he would get hives every time water touched his body. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, you know, you try to give him a bath. He broke out hives. For head An to allergy toe. to water. <laughs> he was allergic to water. And I go, well, he can't be allergic to it. He's made of water. I said, how does he get food drink? And food is full of water. He goes, well, it doesn't bother him. And I go, well, that's weird. So I'm going, okay, so what does he drink? Juice? And he can drink water from a straw. But if it gets on his lips, he'll break out in hives from head to toe. And I'm like going, huh? <laughs> and it's so not turned, like fluoride or chlorine or like he's not having a reaction to the chemicals in nope. water? I asked her if she was, if I said even distilled water, he goes, he goes, even distilled water. And I go, okay. So I turned to the person, the child's angel and guide. And I go, what's going on? Well, I go, so well, he drowned in a past life. And I go, well, okay. People drown in past lives. This doesn't happen. He goes, well, there was extenuating circumstances. And I'm like going, okay, so what happened? So he was, um, he goes, well, I say, they said first, he goes, this started when he was 10 and a half months old. And I go, okay, so what happened there? He goes, well, I was in a tub, bathtub of water, two inches in it. Mom's sitting right next to him, splish splashing away. And mom, babies watched mom's eyes. And so mom turned to get the towel and he followed her with his eyes and he went backward and his arms got in the water and he's 10 months old. So he flailed and he got water up his nose and he coughed and sputtered. And mom picked him up and toweled him off. Everything was fine. That's a normal thing to happen. And it has to happen. So children learn to be slightly afraid of water. And the, um, um, But two weeks later, the hive showed up. And she said, yeah, that is exactly what happened. And I go, okay. So the guy then explained to me what happened to him in a past life. And it was a recent past life. And the, um, I go, he, he was a female child. He was seven and the, um, in that life. And he had a, she had a younger brother and a newborn baby brother. And the mother got postpartum psychosis mm. and drowned the baby brother in front of her, drowned the next one, and then drowned her. Mm. And she saw all of it. And that mother is still in prison today in Colorado. Mm. And I said, you have got to be kidding me. These are those kids? He goes, well, it's the oldest one. She was the one who got the most trauma. He goes, we might get the second one to you. The first one won't have the trauma built in. But that wasn't supposed to happen. So we need to take care of the ramifications. So what happened is this. When the child born in this life, it was only two years between lives, he was sat in that water, flipped over, panicked because of the water going up his nose and what have you. And the past life memory to a 10 month old child who has no, doesn't have enough neural pathways or everything, water and mom equals death. So he was having this immune reaction to extreme fear, but his body wasn't old enough to show it. So what happens when you have extreme fear, you break out in hives. 
That's one of the symptoms. So we did the work. He'd only had the problem for seven months. He went home and took a bath. He's 10 years old now. He's never had a hive since. But the reason I use this example is because I want people to imagine for a moment that that guy, that that kid that didn't get it fixed. And he was 50 when he came to me. What happened to his brain, emotional well-being and spiritual well-being? If he'd had this his whole life, he'd be known as stinky in school. He'd be rejected. He couldn't get jobs. He wouldn't be able to get married or have girlfriends or if you have boyfriends, whatever. He wouldn't. He wouldn't be. He wouldn't be accepted. He'd have huge psychological issues. Well, we got to deal with that. And this is what healers of all sorts have to deal with. They don't really know they have to deal with it. They have to deal with how the neural pathways have developed in the brain and get that work through. It takes time. Mm -hmm. If he'd have highs for 50 years because of water, what would he have to fix psychologically? So I work with psychologists. I work with psychiatrists. I work with all these different modalities, all the way up natural and, and, and allopathic, to get the person's brain to go along with the healing, too. Mm -hmm. And that's full healing. When you sit there and you abracadabra, wave your hand over people, move energy, fine. It's, it feels good. It's great. There's benefit to it. But oftentimes, the ailment will go away for a short time, and then it will come back. Because their neural pathways are still hardwired for that behavior. Exactly. Right. That's why I don't, I, I love hypnosis. Don't get me wrong. I'm actually, a, I'm trained as a trainer in hypnosis. I can train uh -huh. people to be, to be certified and do it medically. Um, but what I don't like about hypnosis is that when you do deep trance, um, there's, they are not involved. You've removed right. them from their own healing, and that is disempowering because you can you can do great work. Hypnosis is great, but it is so it's so limited because you remove them from their own healing, and it, and they you know just like you said, if they don't if they don't if they're not involved in their own healing and they're not in, actively involved in rewiring their own brain, then then it's not complete. Well, it's. Hypnosis has a very powerful purpose. Mm -hmm. Things that you have worked through, that the neural pathways are still there, it's great because you've worked through the problem. You've gone, maybe you've sought medical help, you've sought psychological help, you've da da da, da and you've learned from the experiences right. that have that has that gives you these neuroses, but you still have the neuroses. Well, the hypnosis then, and I'll plug it here because the hypnosis. The person's worked through the issue. So the hypnosis then can relieve the reaction and give the brain another opportunity to do something else. Mm -hmm. So it has a very powerful, it's a very powerful tool for someone who's on the, is right there. And we all get there just by wisdom, by living. We get in many subjects, many things that bother us. We grow out of them, so to speak. And hypnosis will help us do that. And it's a very powerful tool. But there's things that hypnosis, because exactly what you said, you're removing the person from it. If it's you can't remove something before it's time, mm. you can wave your hand, you can push it over here, you can see it leave the energy field. But if you still got the problem, it's going to come back or still have the neural pathways. So hypnosis is a powerful tool and part of it. And I will, I will, you know. It's it's like allopathic medicine. It's a very powerful tool and part of healing, but it doesn't answer all of the questions for uh, things that a person isn't through. So like I I had this man come out here and um, he was a psychopath, mm. and the guides wanted me to work with him, and I go okay, <laughs> great. And his <laughs> his father actually killed people. Mm. and he picked this up, and it was a predatory energy. And I'm looking at him for the first time. I didn't know anything about him. I go, dude, you got a brain tumor. He goes, well, yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I go, okay, it's on your pituitary gland. He goes, yep, it's true, it is. And I go, well, they show it turning to water and going away. And he goes, okay. And I go, 
Okay, so we moved on. The rest of the session worked through stuff, found out he was, he was psychopath too, has got this energy from his father, predatory energy. And he remembers some of the things his father had done. And the um so long, long story short, he goes home. This was December 29th, literally. It was six years ago. And the um and on December 31st at eleven forty five PM, twelve fifteen minutes before midnight. He started having epileptic seizures. And his wife happens to be an MD. So, of course, they knew he had cancer and they were afraid, oh my gosh. And um, they rushed him to the hospital and they sedated him, put him in the CT scan, and that tumor had turned to water. Nice. And it was septic. Ooh. So it was causing the, causing the epileptic seizures, the septic of the disintegrated cancer and so they put a tube up through his eye past his eye and went up into the brain sucked it out and he was fine he's been fine ever since now why does he get a healing like that and people that are don't have this history they get healing slower or not at all i'm not in control of that i just am there he what i didn't know is he got a lot of healing because of the actual disappearing of the cancer. All healing is for the education of the soul. So he got to experience something and have a miracle, and it changed his life. And so, you know, me working on him going, no, you know, I would say he doesn't deserve it. He's a psychopath where these people that are beautiful, innocent, lovely people, positive outlooks, and they get these diseases, and, the, um, and they're sick for long periods of time, and you want to really help them, where this guy's kind of nuts, and you don't want to help him. <laughs> That's why I don't leave. <laughs> and, they, um, and he got the healing out because of the incident of the healing. He got many more healings out on his own, and he became a good father and husband. And the um, um, where these other people have to go through their process, and then they become a better person. So again, that's why we call this eternal psychology, because it has to do with so much in your own body psychology as well as the souls and what it's learning. The taste of chocolate's pretty good, so the souls keep coming back for more. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned that anger is a tertiary emotion. Can you explain that? Well, anger is a, a part. Our primary emotion is safety. Period. Everything relates to safety, and even even in giving, getting married, you know, falling in love relates to safety because we do things better in numbers. And the um um. So that's the primary emotion. Secondary emotions are things that. Are like frustration. Um, um, what's another secondary emotion? Um, a reaction to something that is like um, a secondary emotion is love, um, because it has frustration and love have to do with you being safe. It all can be related back to safety. Well, anger comes when you're frustrated, when you're um, unheard. That's a primary emotion or secondary emotion. When you're unrecognized secondary emotion, a person gets angry. That's why it's a tertiary emotion. And the, um, cause you got safety, not recognized anger. So it's a reaction to a reaction. Correct. So the, the, if, if we're not, if, if something happens and we don't feel safe, then we might not feel, we might feel unheard, unloved, frustrated, right. Um, so there's some, some, a reaction to something taking away our safety. Correct. And then if that persists, then the tertiary emotion would be anger around, um, mm -hmm. the continuation of, of right. that, of not feeling safe. That, that makes sense. Cause like, um, fear, for example, people think fear is a primary emotion, but I tell people like, if you're in a burning house, if your house is on fire and you're on the second floor, um, you're not going to stand there in fear and you're not going to start thinking which window should you jump out of. You're just going to, you're just going to go, you're going to jump out of the window. The stress response right. is going to take over. And 
And then like five minutes later, you're going to start crying and shaking. And that's when the fear kicks in. <laughs> and it's, right. But the, it's like, oh, my God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the fear does not happen during it. Um, it's when, you know, that's that's when just survival instinct, you know, yeah, you don't feel safe <laughs> in that moment. But you're not going to feel fear until usually until after we get out of it. But we tend to mistake heart racing, palm sweating and a reaction to survival as fear. But fear is that that. um you know, later on response, right? Well, one of the one of the things I've learned, and and it's a lesson for me as well as everybody else, is emotions are amazing. All of them, and words are amazing to try to express those emotions. Mm -hmm. If we look at them as amazing, instead of as positive emotions or negative emotions, they just are. A soul doesn't have emotions. So it comes, the animal has emotions. The soul can learn emotions, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but the animal has the emotions. And so if you, the soul looks at anger as amazing, it's opportunity for growth. Anger, by the time a person's angry, what are they frustrated about? What needs to be learned? Why are they feeling unsafe? Why, if they feel unrecognized, why don't they say something? It's when they don't say something that they become angry. So we look at anger, we look at the negative emotions and positive emotions as opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if we all looked at them as opportunity, we wouldn't try to get away from them. We wouldn't deny them. We would just simply go through the emotion. You know, it's like, uh, you know, we get depression. Everyone does, at least, you know, every month to six weeks or so, people get a little bit of depression. And it's like, Okay, so I'm depressed right now. I'm having depression. I can we can go, oh my god, I'm depressed now, and it leads to more depression. Or we can go, yeah, I'm depressed right now. Yeah, it's a matter of fact. And it's kind of a guy way of looking at things a little bit, but it's true. If we look at the emotion, if we look at feeling unloved, what needs to be said? What's the opportunity here for growth? And so that's one of the positive things we teach people here is to look at every emotion as opportunity. And I don't care how dramatic it is. And I've had lots of pain and suffering in my life. So I've had to put it in many different ways, but it's like, you know, my brother passing when he was really young and I was young. It's like, I grew from it. Was it painful? You bet. Is it still painful today? You bet. And that was 40, 50 years ago, 49 years ago. And you don't ever recover from that. You place it and you learn from it. You know, people go, oh, you, you'll get over it in a while. No, you don't. And, the, and I'm proud of that. I'm, I love emotions. And, the, um, um, and you place it and you, it revisits it once in a while. But why would you revisit it? Well, there's something going on in your life. It's opportunity. It's time to look and see what's going on. All emotions that way. If a healer such as myself, you have to look at the high emotions of the day and the low emotions of the day. And that is your opportunity for growth. The ones in the middle, you're hashing out. The ones on the extreme ends, those are the opportunities for growth. And so anger gets turned into positive searching. Frustration is opportunity for conversation. So, so I mean, all these negative emotions, we think we have 3,000 different phrases or words for negative emotions in the English language. All of them are opportunity. So Brilliant. that's how we look at everything here. I love it. Anger is an opportunity for positive searching. Frustration is an opportunity for communication. Right. I have a list of... Uh, so I, I do this mostly for men because men have the hardest time with words, right? And they're called, it's, um, I'm, I'm opening it on the computer here. Um, where to go? Common negative emotions open. And the, um, um, so you have ashamed. Well, instead of feeling ashamed and scurrying, that causes depression. Why don't we look at why we're ashamed and what who we need to talk to about it, mm. what we need to learn? Or you look at being criticized. Well, what is it? 
is the person is a person a family member? Do they love you? So they're criticizing you for your benefit? Or is this some idiot that's just a jerk on the street? A little different, different thing, a jerk on the street? Well, okay, is there something he's warning, this person on the street's warning me of? Or is it just someone's mental constructs? Or family at home, someone criticizes, well, is it their love language? You know, parents criticize their children because they're trying to teach them to grow up, to be an, a functioning human adult. And so, Okay, so criticism from a parent might be as a three-year-old is like, oh, but as a 14-year-old is like, <laughs> and they may be the same line. So how do you teach the four-year-old to look at criticism for its source, and, or the 14-year-old for its source, instead of making them feel, instead of having their emotion bring them to anger? So everything has a positive is the point. You know, if you're insulted, What's the source? What do you do with the energy? I teach people to move energy. So we were talking earlier about something like client, you know, people, your listeners could go away with. Well, just briefly, um, along this line of emotions, is a thing we call um, the energy exchange. And I wish everybody did this. I'm going to explain it very briefly here. And there's a lot, there's a lot to it, but it's quite simple. But Basically, the energy exchange is this. We use the third chakra, which is between the belly button and the sternum. This is often referred to as your center of power. And it is the chakra that's designed to balance energy. So if you have you ever heard of Qigong? Yes, I love Qigong. Oh, it's great. Now, you, you use the third chakra to make a Qigong ball, right? And you build this energy up, and you can people... A lot most people can feel over time kind of a ball of energy forming outside of their solar plexus, and that's often referred to as a qigong ball. And the um, and you fill it full of positiveness, and you put it in a knee, or you send it to a friend with love, or you know healing thoughts, and you put it in a hip. Well, you take this idea, and let's say someone is has criticized you, and uh, maybe you're driving. It's a common one, and someone flips you off when you're driving. Well, you don't know the person. The person may have had a bad day, a bad life, a bad this, that, or the other. And at that moment, the person is throwing you their bad life through their finger. <laughs> and literally, I get to see that energy. It's a powerful stream of energy that will go directly to someone through this gesture. Well, what do you do with that? We're energetic beings. We absorb it. Well, if you were raised by a medicine man and woman, they would have taught you when you were five what to do with that. Basically, it's like, okay, here it comes, and it goes right through and right back out the third chakra back to that individual. And you literally visualize, okay, the guy, uh, instead of going, getting mad at the guy or, or lady for flipping you off, you go, oh, well, that's their bad life. And you've taken it in already because you've observed it. So qigong ball instant qigong ball from your third chakra send it back to them so it's giving you a different neural pathway instead of being anger upon anger when you're driving your anger upon opportunity to give someone their own energy back is it their own energy and, back or did you transmute it nope you we don't we we set this up so it's their energy and you don't want to transmute it because when you're transmuting it you're saying to that person um you're, you're taking away their process you're saying okay i'm going to transmute it send it back to you as love instead of sending it back to them w with love so it's here learn mm. if you transmute it to love they get love for flipping someone off Oh, yeah, we don't want to reinforce that. Right. If you give it <laughs> to them in love, out of love, rather, excuse me, then they feel that, but they also feel what they did. Oh. And I guarantee you, you do this on a daily level. I don't care if a person, your spouse, is, is um, pontificating. You know, we all get emotions and we all have little spats and arguments and this and that with our loved ones. They're the ones we beat up the most because they can't get away. <laughs> 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 but, <you> know, 
<laughs> but it's like while they're pontificating to you, instead of trying to fix them and make it better and safe for yourself, so you're absorbing, 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 and trying to take in the knowledge and give some brilliant little thing to make them feel better. Instead of doing that, you're like, oh, I see they're having a bad day or a bad moment or their hormones are up. You know, if on a different day, we've discussed the same thing and we didn't have an argument, but today it's an argument. So let's just give it back to them. So how do we do that? Qigong ball. So it comes in because you've experienced it. And now you're pulling it together in that third chakra and you're simply sending it back to them saying, here, learn. And I guarantee you, the argument would not escalate. The they will feel what they're doing instead of just spreading the crap. They're actually feeling their crap, so to speak. Mm. And they calm down and there's no codependency. They're not depending on you to calm them down. They're learning how to calm themselves. So you do this. Let's say someone's rude at the store. Heaven forbid. And they, uh, instead of getting mad at them, just give them their energy back. Just through a third chakra, a ball of energy, back to them. So you're, you're sitting here going, you know, energy has power. And we have to remember energy has power. What happens when someone yells in the mountains in an avalanche area? That wave causes an avalanche. Well, when people are arguing, it's worse. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's nasty. <laughs> yep. I, I had that experience as a kid. You know, my parents love, you know, loved me and uh -huh. they would fight. And I didn't, you know, all I, I would just feel the energy and my tummy would hurt. And I would exactly. feel like I was walking on eggshells. Right. And, um, and, you know, and they, they loved each other, you know, and, and um, I wasn't really tuning into the words they were saying, but they were, they were fighting. Right? right. And so and I just I remember as a kid the energy of that and how um, destructive it was. Right. And if you would have been taught when you were five by a medicine woman or a medicine man to do the energy exchange, you wouldn't have ever felt that way. You would have felt that way once you would have gone to them and they would have said, well, why do you feel you have to fix them? Why do you feel you must they must do something different? They would have taught you. Adults argue. Mm -hmm. So why not just give them the energy back? You don't need a tummy ache. You don't need to be upset. You don't need to be, need to be afraid of what is referred to as negative uh, emotions because they're actually quite positive. What were, your parent, what were your parents trying to do? They were trying to come up with solutions. Yep. And they, uh, But the child doesn't experience that. Right. If the child knows to give them the energy back, they get to go and run and play because they didn't engage. So the neural pathways of fear of heated discussion wouldn't have been put in place. You would have just gone, oh, that's their stuff. They're working it out. Bye, I'm out here playing. So how much different, just with your example, would you be today if you had been taught that? When you were oh five. my gosh well i know right off the bat i mean I'm, and I'm, I'm i have to preface this with i'm very happy with the person i am now because i've taken exactly what you've said and uh -huh. and 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 which is everything is an opportunity for learning and growth that's and terrific. that's my like philosophy since i was about 20 something and mm -hmm. um and so but i know there were past relationships which i've eventually learned from but there were past mm -hmm. relationships that were um, emotionally and mentally, um, toxic that mm -hmm. I wouldn't have, I would have set up very clear boundaries right off the bat. And they right. made those, those relationships would have been very different, right? They would have been. Yeah. That's what this does. It creates energetic and emotional boundaries mm -hmm. just by, because you're able to step back and go, that's not mine. That's theirs. I don't have to fix it. That's their thing to fix. And if it keeps coming up for them, then you go because you didn't dive into it. You go, you know, that keeps coming up for you. You might get some help with that. But I'm not your therapist. <laughs> and the, it allows that degree of separation while you're there. So it actually makes the relationship better. Because you're not trying to fix the person. Mm -hmm. For the listeners who don't know how to make a chi ball or can you 
pretend like we don't know how to do this, but we really, really want to learn how to do this. Can you walk us through um, the steps? Well, it's mostly it's it's intention. So the steps to create the uh, the the what we're talking about in the energy exchange is just do it. So you just you imagine the person's energy is coming at you, whatever the situation is, and you just you you've experienced it already. It's in your body. You're having a reaction. And you just channel that, if you will. I don't like the word channel very well, but you channel that through the third chakra and it comes out and it creates this massive energy in front of you. You can actually start to move your, put your hands in front of your, up above your belly button and just start, when you start thinking of that, you can push at this air, this space. Say your hands are a foot apart and you push together as you're putting this opportunity, you can feel resistance. And that's the Qigong ball. Now, for the sake of the energy exchange, you don't have to go to that extent. But it's good practice to go to that extent, to start feeling that, to realize that something is actually happening here. And everybody can do this. Everybody can feel it, even the skeptics. <laughs> <laughs> and they, even them, I know. And they, uh, they can feel this form because we're energetic beings. But they, um, um, when you can do that and create this sponginess that's between the hands and then fill that with love and then send it to somebody and they'll think about you and you'll probably get a phone call saying, you know, I was just thinking about you. But in the meantime, when you do the energy exchange, you create this, you use the same technique, except that you don't create necessarily a ball of energy. You just send it back to them. It could be a stream. You know, if someone's pontificating for 15 minutes, you want to give it to them back the whole time they're pontificating. And they um not you don't want to wait till the end to give it back to them. <laughs> and otherwise you'll get riled up too. <laughs> right. So but my, my wife and I use it all the time. Yeah. Do we get riled up? Do we have do we have spats? Yeah. And the uh we're we're the perfectest astrological science for having spats. And the um and it's like, so we have this, but we don't take it personally. It's like, yeah, he's in a bad mood, eh? she's in a bad mood. And the, um, you know, oh, she seems like she's looking for an argument or I'm looking for an argument. And they have, and it's that simple. It doesn't, it's not personal. So we can go to each other. Like my one time I, I pontificated quite heavily after a major remodel in our house. And the, um, um, it had been six months of mess. And I just let it all go one day. And the, um, and my wife just gave me the energy back. I can see her doing it. And they, uh, and I'm just, blah, 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 blah. I brought stuff up from 30 years ago, and we had only been married for 25 at the time. And they, um, and I didn't even know her. And they, um, I mean, I was just, blah, blah, just coming out. And it was lovely. It would have been good for America's Funniest Videos. Anyway, so she's just giving me the energy back. And I ran out of steam, and she goes, do you feel better? I go, God, yes, thank you. <laughs> And she could have taken half of what I said personally. And they, um, um, and but she didn't. She just knew I had to release energy. And it was just coming out. And it was leaking out through my mouth. And it wasn't pretty. But it, it she just kept, me, kept giving my energy back. And so it allows that degree of separation. And that's particularly important for people that are sensitive. People that are not sensitive, they're not energetically aware yet. They're not an old enough soul, you might speak. It's kind of like water under the bridge. But people that are sensitive are the pillars holding up that bridge. <laughs> and all that water is pushing against them. And they take everything in, literally, in many different ways. And it's like this huge mass of energy coming at them constantly. And they call it empathy. And it makes you very sensitive. Well, empathy for someone who's not sensitive is walking in another man's shoes, so to speak. But empathy, empathy for someone that's sensitive is like being hit by a freight car. And it's like, because you're so much more aware of what's going on around you. So someone who's not sensitive and not aware, a typical skeptic, their radar dish is very small, so to speak, for other people's emotions and things like that. Where someone who's very sensitive, their radar dish is radar dish is giant. So they've had they look at the same incident 
and one gets a tickle of energy from it, and the other gets slammed by it. Well, that's where empathy kills. Empathy as a typical young soul, it's just water in the bridge, it's done. You get the argument over with, it's done, and you think about it again. But someone who's got a giant radar dish, when someone flips them off, so to speak, they're experiencing their whole bad life that led to that moment. I don't care if it's an argument. I don't care if it's a disagreement at work. I don't care if it's a bad memo, what they're reading into the memo, because they're experiencing the entire, the entire emotional state that led to that moment for those people. And that's where the energy exchange really comes in handy because you're not made to transmute all of their energy. Your body can't do it. It will kill you. And the um, and this is why so many healers are so ill, beyond the normal illnesses, and because they're pulling in so their radar dish is so huge that their body's constantly under stress, and it makes them sick. So that's why in the beginning I talk. Part of my process is to heal the healers, is to teach them not to do this. I had a guy who came here. He's a healer in the Southwest. Big big name guy he got my name in a dream he comes out here he's 35 years old he was one of the people in the movie the show the secret and then i can't say a name or anything even close so but he comes out here and he gets up on the table for me to work on him and i go dude you've been dead five times he goes yeah i keep dying i don't want to be here anymore and i looked at him i go no that's not true I said, you're an old soul. You've come here as an old soul, and you experience too much. And he looked at me like, what? And I guess I explained to him what I just explained to you and your listeners. And he looked at me, and he goes, you're right. I'm killing myself. I go, yeah. Because that's one of the biggest jokes I have with the new age. Is there a bunch of sensitives? So life is really hard for them. But the soul wants to be here. It wants to experience human life in all of its intricacies. But their body is so sick of the soul's needs. The soul needs to experience all of this empathy, if you will, so it can grow and learn. But it had, they haven't learned what to do with it. So their body's going, I would rather be six feet under than to have this again i'm done and it's only because they don't know what to do they're being bombarded because their radar dish is so huge that they're, they're just going i'm out of here i can't be here anymore and they get so stressed they get diseases they get all this stuff you know these people and it's unfortunately it's most of the new age and it's like no we have to teach people how to deal with this and then their life becomes good. And then they don't, they never make the statement again, I'm out of here. I don't ever want to come back. I have risen above this. I'm beyond all this. No, those are ego statements of the body saying, uh, no, I don't want anyone to have your soul in it. I would, I want to be six feet under. I am done. <laughs> and because it's because they're literally, it's World War III in, inside their body all the time. And the, uh, the energy exchange is a beginning step on what to do with empathy. I catch myself feeling other people, uh, feeling emotions sometimes. And I'm like, I don't, like, I really have to become aware because I'm like, if I, if I let it, uh, if, I, if I go unconscious about it, then I sort of feel like I'm a, a crazy person or like yo-yo. And mm -hmm. then I, I catch myself and I go, I have to ask myself, like, is this mine? Am I feeling, right. am I just picking up on other people's stuff or is this exactly. my own emotion? And there'll be times where I'll be like out of nowhere, like depression or sadness or something. Right. And I'm like sitting right. there going, it's, this isn't mine. I'm really, and then I get like the person I was near working, talking to that uh -huh. I was really just tapping in and feeling them. Exactly. Um, but a lot of times I have sort of been a feeling very yo-yo around my emotions when I'm not conscious of the fact that sometimes not like the sensations I have are, mm -hmm. are, are me feeling other people and not just me feeling myself. And so exactly. we need to learn 
how to like I love what you describe with your wife this technique that we could use in all our communication is is not to take things personally but just allow it to flow back to them be be a wonderful mirror for them and allow it to flow back to them and let them um you know we stay strong we don't let it stick to us or take it personally um or you know or let it harm us and then they uh -huh. get to like empty out faster well they don't become dependent on someone else people dump their energy they almost you know they, they throw it at people I get the opportunity. Sometimes you'll see me ducking. <laughs> but it's like it's like they throw it at people and challenge you to make them better. And when you make people better, you're crippling them. They have to make themselves better. When they depend on you to calm down, they're not learning to self-calm. And this is so often between couples, and especially. But it's like anyone with that big radar dish, you've, for your job, it is terrific, that big radar dish. It allows you to be a better uh, interviewer, right? You intuitively get questions to ask, to follow along, da, da 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 Well, when you're done with the radio, each radio show, what do you do with the energy? You've opened yourself up to listen to people, to be, and put yourself on, on excitement so you can be a good, interesting talk show host. Well, when you hang up the phone or are done with the radio show, what are you doing? Do you ever give them their energy back? No, you sit there and you hold it in just in case you might need it. It's a, because you just simply weren't taught. Your brain will remember me, maybe. And the, um, it, it, it's, it's a perfectly good computer device that we use. We don't have to hold the energy of it. You know, what has led to me being who I am today. A lot of pain and suffering. So a lot of my wisdom has energy with it from that pain and suffering, but it's wisdom now. So you can absorb, you know, a week from now, you'll be thinking of the interview or something else, and all of a sudden you might get one of my illnesses that I've had in the past. Or you start feeling that. And you, a week later, you don't know where it's from, but it's from this interview a week before because it took that long for the empathy to start affecting your body. So well, every time you finish with, with a talk show, you need to send the person's energy back and say, thank you, this was wonderful. And it's love, this is totally love. If you try to send it back like something to somebody that was mean to you and you, ar, 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 you guys won't let you do it. But if you send it back here, learn, have fun with that. It was an interesting experience, and they have, and it goes right to them, and they start to feel it. They start to feel they might, if they, if they feel, they might feel a little guilty for being too harsh on a person. But if you don't give it back to them, they will never feel that, and they will never grow. And so this energy exchange is, is there's there's four different steps of it, which we it takes another hour to talk about, but that's the beginning part of it is learn to, by doing this, you're placing yourself and you're placing your empathy correctly. And it makes empathy not deadly. It makes empathy worth having at the level of the large radar dish. It makes it safe. So you can take in the information, do your job, and then get rid of the energy of it and just keep the mental constructs. And the, um, um, and it, it makes it so that people with big radar dishes can live and not get ill. So if your readers can go away with that, some of them can learn from it. If they need to know more. Of course, it's, you know, ericthornton.com. And, um, and they can, you know, contact me, have a session, and learn and grow. And, they, uh, again, my purpose, main purpose is to heal the healers, to teach them what the medicine men and women would have taught them in a different time. I love it. I love this uh, idea of t knowing how to harness our empathy uh, yeah. so that it is. And that just, you know, like you but said, safe. It's, it's energetic and emotional boundaries. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's and funny with interviewing. Um, I will, you know, when it's getting close to like a two hour interview, um, mm -hmm. I'll start feeling antsy and frustrated and kind of like high strung. And, mm -hmm. and I'm like, where is this coming from? And then after we finish the interview and they, you know, 
we've said goodbye mm-hmm. after we I, I stop recording we say our goodbyes mm-hmm. and I feel it for like a few hours and I'm like what is going on and it's told and I realized that it was them and I was really picking up on maybe they had to go maybe you know something maybe they had to pee or whatever and they had to get off but they didn't want to tell me but there'll right. be time and there'll be times when like I'll feel just like excitement and love like I'll just really feel feel different emotions and it's and I and I get that it, I'm feeling like I'm I'm really tapping into the the person I'm interviewing and uh-huh. and you're right I really do hold on to that energy for like the rest of the day and sometimes it, it kind of gunks up my 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 day well and then it gets stuffed into our bo- you know to our Pandora's box energetic Pandora's box and it sits there and it you know it can bother us subconsciously you know 90% of our brain is subconscious and so then we start behaving and having the ailments or things like that of our people that we've worked with. And that's not okay. That's, that's empathy on steroids when you got that big radar dish and it's not okay to do it. It's great. We want to make empathy and compassion safe instead of having it damage. And the, uh, and the healer has to make, be able to turn, the authentic healer has to be able to have it be safe and not all not pick up all the diseases of all their clients <laughs> and the um and it's that is where we go wrong and that's where people get so ill you know i've been doing this full time for 20 years and the um and people go wow that's amazing people only usually only last two or three years or maybe five how do you do it like <laughs> well the energy exchange I literally don't take on people's energy. And so for me standing there working with someone, it's just like someone standing there talking. I literally, I got nothing that's happening to my body from other people. Do I have my own problems? Yes. But I don't pass them on and I don't take on other people's problems. Well, when you say problems though, I think we need to think about it in the, in the light that you have described that we welcome problems as right. a as a way of growing and experiencing and that you know yeah we, sh- we it would be really boring if none of us had any problems there would be nothing to grow from correct <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's good that you have so, problems yes we that, that's how we look at things but some but people don't you know if someone's the, the reason i use the word problems at this p- particular point is because for them their constructs, whatever led to that moment where they're supposed to be learning and they didn't and it became a problem, um, that's what we're picking up as the, as the healer. We're picking up the reason they have the problem or the issue and the, um, that needs to be turned into something positive. But the fact is it wasn't turned into something positive prior to them meeting you. So that it's negativity, what we might call negativity, back behind that moment. And I, for one, don't need that. That's not, you know, you don't see pictures of medicine men and women doing the drama of the tribe. <laughs> they, they're kind of these mellow people sitting there and they're going, yeah, sure, good. Have fun with that. We'll see you in a week or two when you um, have thoroughly learned that, your lesson. <laughs> and, they, and they just don't participate in the tribe's drama. Mm-hmm. Well, medicine men and women, they don't participate in the drama of their clients. They they have compassionate detachment, which makes it so they can have a way more compassion. If you have compassionate attachment, which is a compassion empathy, your body gets overwhelmed and you get sick. And where if you have compassionate detachment, compassion is wonderful. You get to help people without being harmed in the short run or the long run. And it makes it so the healer, if they don't do the human, the drama, they don't do that dance that we all do, um, then they can keep doing their work. This concludes our interview with Eric Thornton. My uh, recording software ended a little prematurely just before we wrapped up this interview, but it was a perfect spot that it ended, luckily for us. I want to let you know that if you're interested in uh, checking out 
every, anything that Eric does, you can go to ericthornton.com. I'll make sure that the link to his website and his contact information is in the show notes of today's episode at learntruehealth.com. So you can go to ericthornton.com to see his um, articles and to contact him. Or you can also go to learntruehealth.com and uh, see all the show notes about today's interview, as well as the link to Eric's site. We're going to have Eric back on the show next month. So if you have questions for him that you'd like me to ask during our next interview, please come to our Facebook group, the Learn True Health Facebook group, and ask away. Just post your questions there, and I will make sure that... I save them up for you and I ask Eric when I have him on the show later next month. Thank you so much for being a listener and I hope you thoroughly enjoyed today's interview as much as I did. Remember to go to learntruehealth.com slash 10 to sign up for your free essential oils webinar that's happening this Thursday. It's going to be fantastic. And of course... Share this episode with those you love who you know would benefit from hearing the wisdom that Eric has shared with us today. And be sure to have yourself a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you.